Hello, Paris. I see some familiar faces here. I head the engineering group uh, for the wireless networking group at Cisco. So today we're going to talk about indoor location. And I thought before we get started with indoor location, let's go back in history a little bit and look at what location is been in history. So any idea what the first known maps, where were they found or when was this? Sixteen hundred eighty or BC? No, no, much before that. Much, much before that. Any other guess? Walid, what about you? I think it was somewhere near where you live. Yeah, it's it's actually close. So fourteen thousand years ago. No, actually, this is not Egypt. It's in Spain. Fourteen thousand years ago, there were some drawings on a cave which were the earliest known, you know, maps. Now, to me, this looks like graffiti on, on a wall, so I'm not quite counting this. The earliest I could find was a Babylonian tablet, which you can find this in the uh, British Museum. And this goes back around 2,500 years. And um, if you see, this is a very interesting map. This one is uh, shown as two circles. You see the two concentric circles? So the circle inside represents the landmass, and the space between the inside and the outside circle represents the ocean. So it's kind of interesting that in the early Babylonian times, they did think of the Earth as round, or spherical. And needless to say, they thought Babylon was the center of you know, the, uh, the Earth. Any idea where Babylon is? Yeah, now, now Walid knows the answer. It's somewhere near, in Iraq, somewhere near Baghdad. So this little rectangle you see in the center, that's uh, Babylon. And the vertical rectangle, that's the river Euphrates that's flowing through Babylon. And if you see those triangles that are on the periphery of the outer circle, those are the islands in a distance that folks at that time could just see. They probably couldn't go quite there. What they needed really to navigate the seas was the next set of technology, which is the compass. And the compass actually has the first known origins uh, back in 1100 AD. And the first written account of it is um, you know, used for maritime navigation is in China in 1117 AD. And interestingly, the Europeans were far behind. It was like 1250 AD or so. And so there's still a healthy debate on whether it was the Chinese technology that was exported to Europe through the Arabs, or it was just independently discovered. So before you guys get worried that I'm going to take you on a history lesson, let me, let me get to more modern times, which is GPS, right? I'm sure some of you can't imagine a world without GPS. But uh, for people like me, I am still uh, remember AAA's tip triptychs when I used to you know, go on vacation. I see some smiles. So the GPS satellite was first launched by the Department of Defense for military purposes in 1978. And this was classified, this was only for military use, until 1983. And in 1983, what happened was a Korean jet, a Korean airline um, flew into Russian territory and was shot down. And so the Reagan administration decided to open up GPS for civilian purposes so that you know, we don't get airplanes shot down uh, randomly. And I'm sure all of you here are pretty grateful for it since we do a lot of flying today. But any idea how GPS works? No? Yeah? Walid is close. Walid has done his homework, I can see. But, but, but GPS is relatively similar to indoor location. So I'll just go into how it works. So what happens is your receiver gets messages from the satellite. And these messages have a timestamp, and they have um, a location. And so when you receive this, because you know how far the signal has traveled in space, you roughly know a circle that you could lie in. So that red circle is what you could uh, figure out given a signal from one satellite. So if you have three satellites, then you have three circles. And where these three circles intersect, that blue point in the middle is your location. 
So roughly that's how it works. Um, but you need more than three satellites to figure this out accurately. In fact, in the uh, geostationary orbit today, we have around 30 satellites. And to get a fix, you need a signal of um, you know, at least four satellites. So all of this technology you know, is basically works outside. But when you come inside, you pretty much can't use um, GPS. So what we have inside is similar technology, but working the other way. Instead of having three satellites that are sending a signal, you have one device that's sending a signal that's received by three access points. And so these three access points receive your signal and are able to triangulate. Now this is not the only technology that is used. You also have RF fingerprinting. So when you're walking this hall, you can record exactly the signal strength that you've received from the different access points and figure out your location based on that. So there's a whole bunch of technology that comes into play. And if I was to, to sum it up, you'd see this table which kind of lists the accuracy that you can get. So I have two columns. One is indoor and the other is outdoor. And for the rows, it's the technology that is used. So if you're walking in, in San Francisco, for example, it's sometimes very difficult to get a GPS fix. And so what you would be reduced to is the lowest level, which is called network-based location. And how that works is it just figures out from the cell tower. What's the idea of the cell tower? That's, that's, the, that's the most basic one. Or you could do triangulation of the cell towers, which will get you to about half a kilometer accuracy. And then you have uh, GPS, which gets you somewhere in the 50 meter range. So the GPS that you use typically would be 50 meters. And also the challenge with GPS, because I explained how it works, is it takes time to get a fix. Any of you had these uh, GPS systems from three or four years ago, handheld ones, if you recall, they used to take a very long time to fix. So if you use one of these things that for running, it takes a long time to fix because you don't know exactly where the satellite is, or you may have reflection. And so there is something called hybrid, which uses a combination of GPS as well as the cell tower triangulation. And so that's called assisted GPS. And that gets you down to the 25 meter um, range. And that's pretty much the technology that we use when we, when we use our phone outside. If you come inside, and it's infrastructure based, it depends on how close you deploy your access points. So with a typical access point deployment, like in this location, you can get down to anywhere between 3 and 10 meters. So it's 3 or 10 meters indoors, and it's about 20 meters or so, 20 to 50 meters outdoors. And finally, if you really wanted coarse, you know, a fine-grained location, you could deploy Bluetooth devices at fixed locations all over your uh, venue, and then use that as an assist to get your position. So this is kind of the overlay of the location technologies. What I'm going to focus next in the talk is really around you know, the action that's happening in, in the industry and how we can use this to build on top of this. Why is there so much attention on indoor location? Let me pause a little bit because if there are any questions, I want to encourage you to feel free to interrupt me. I think there's a mic somewhere and they will come around. There's a mic here. Any questions? OK, so if you see, in recent couple of years, there's been a lot of activity on indoor location. So Google started uh, a couple of years ago when they acquired Terahawk Networks. So this was a company that went bankrupt, but they had a bunch of location patents. And so Google acquired them for 10 million or something like that just to get their location patents. Apple is trying to get in this space. They acquired a company called Wi-Fi Slam, which was a small startup with just you know, three or four individuals. And they were doing RF fingerprinting and location assist on a device. And like that, if you see that all of the other access point or wireless vendors have been you know, snapping up location-based companies. And the reason for this is very simple. The reason is that over the last few years, all of us are carrying a smartphone device. And that smartphone device has Wi-Fi turned on. And so when you're walking into venues with your Wi-Fi turned on, the infrastructure can detect your location. It can do things like counting and so forth that makes it very attractive for establishments, for enterprises to figure out analytics or to provide services or make their services better. So 
if you look, over the last three or four years, a ton of companies have gotten, and to date there are around 170 companies that are in the indoor location space. And most of them are pretty much getting started right now, as I mentioned. But if you take a look at, at Cisco, we've been actually at this for the last four or five years, and we are focused on the entire ecosystem. So it's not just the location part, but it's what we call a connected mobile experience. And you can think of this as kind of three separate phases. So the first one is detect. How do I detect that somebody is in my venue or in my establishment? How do I detect their device? So once you do the detection, the next part is connecting with that person, the person who's holding the device. He or she may want access to the network, and in return, you may be able to provide them some services, and that's the last part, which is how do you engage with the owner of the device. So this is kind of the broad umbrella under which CMX operates. And what I'll spend a little bit of time on is how, what is the technology that we use to build this ecosystem. So let's start with the detection part. So if you see when you have your device, you're sending out a probe every so often. And pretty much what a probe is, is it goes on every Wi-Fi channel and sends out information seeking to find out what SSID is there. And that probe is received by multiple access points. And if it's received by three access points or more, you can triangulate the location of this device based on the signal strength. And then you can do this not only on the probe, but you can also do it on the data. So remember, the probe is infrequent. It's you know, every hundreds of seconds. And so what will happen is your location will be stale. Whereas your device is sending data constantly, and you can actually do the uh, detection on the data. Now the challenge with doing it on the data is that data is only going in one channel. And your access points, your three access points, may be listening on three different channels. And so you do, do need to make sure that your access points are all able to tune to the channel where the data is being sent. And so there's a bunch of things we're doing in this space to get the latency down to a few seconds. So it's like five or six seconds. So once we detect the device, what we do is we send this information to something called an MSC, a mobility services engine, which pretty much collects all of this information, calculates this, does analytics on it, and presents it to you in a simple web interface. So, and you can see a lot of this technology in, uh, in the booths and World of Solution, as well as play with it here on this uh, DevNet zone. Now this is you know, just the analytics part. But you may also want to build applications on your device that make use of this. If you want to build a wayfinding application, for example. So there what you do is you build, like we provide an SDK that you embed in your application. And the MSC sends notifications to the application server. And these are actually delivered to your um, application on the device through the SDK. So for example, suppose you moved out of a zone. And what would happen is a trigger would be sent to the MSC. That trigger would translate into an event to the application server, and then a notification would be sent to your SDK. So this is kind of, at a high level, how the ecosystem works for CMX. And the um, use cases are pretty broad of how you could use this. So if you think about the industries, it could be retail, it could be hospitality, it could be airports, it could be higher education. As an example, con consider an airport, right? You could have your um, security checkpoints really, really crowded, and lines could be long, and airports are large. So by simply looking at the number of devices, the analytics of the number of devices that are there, you get a good sense that this thing is crowded. You need to send more security officers so that you can make the lines move faster. So this is a use case that we are working with customers like in Changi Airport, uh, and Copenhagen to really streamline. Similarly, if you're in the retail industry, you are very eager to find out how many people walk by your store. Or the mall may want to price ads or stores based on the traffic that is there. So this will help you detect that. Sometimes you're interested in the trending. So for stores, 
pretty much they want to know how many of the customers that walked by were converted into actual customers. And sometimes they may want to know whether the window display had an impact on this. So if you know the days your display was changed, and then you figure out that the foot traffic conversion rate increased, you know that this display was a good one, it's a keeper. So there are many use cases like this that we are working with a bunch of different partners and end customers to, to make happen. Now, alternatively, so this is the analytics part I talked about, but you, alternatively you have the SDK, which you can use to not only notify people when, when customers walk in, but sometimes you've downloaded an application and you really have no clue that the Macy's app is on your phone. So when you walk in the store, through the SDK, you get a notification that you walked in the store, it wakes up your application, and then the application can provide you service or offer you a coupon. So that's the other use case that um, you know we see quite often in this space. So let me switch gears now and talk about how easy it is to build an application, because the CMX is not only a self-contained um, environment, but it also exposes northbound APIs, REST APIs, that you can call and build an application of your choice. So one such example is this Spot Me application that uh, one of my engineers built. And just to give you an idea, it's a simple web application that uses the REST APIs that the MSC provides and, and creates a very useful uh, bunch of services. So let me give you an example of this. So this is my building. This is the fourth floor in building 14 in San Jose. And one of the things that I was curious about is, you know, how busy is the floor? Where, where are the people sitting, right? And so this map that you see here is a map that's obtained from the MSC, which is the map of the floor. And this application pretty much gets a list of all the clients and plots them as red dots on this map. And what you can see, or what I could see by looking at this, is a bunch of people are clustered around where the meeting rooms are. So most of my engineers are sitting in meetings at this time. So again, this is just an example. This is not something that you know I, um, I'm doing to track people out. So I just uh, want to assure some of my team who's sitting here. Similarly, we could figure out where your employees are. So this is Sujay Hajela who uh, runs all of the uh, product management for enterprise networking. So if he's curious where his direct team is, he simply puts his name in there, this connects with the uh, LDAP directory and figures out the user IDs of his staff and then plots them on the map. Or I could walk into a different building or, or the uh, first floor of the um, building 14 and I could try and look for somebody because I'm there to meet Victor, for example, and I don't know where he is. We have an open seating plan. So I just type in his name and the blue dot shows me exactly where Victor is. So these are simple applications that um, you know, sh provide a lot of value and are very easy to build. So what I did is I took this and I said, let's see what it takes to actually do this. So if you see, there were two main sets of APIs that were used to build this. One is the MSC REST API, and the other is the LDAP directory service from Cisco. So the LDAP service is used pretty much just to get what's the user ID. So when I type in a name like Sujay Hajela, it will return me his user ID, so then I know the uh, device that I find, which user ID it is registered with. If you look at the um, MSC APIs, they're pretty rich, and the ones that were used here, the first is you can get the entire hierarchy of you know, the floor, the building, and the campus. So you know, you know where each floor plan is located. You could actually get the image. So that's what was rendered there. It was the image of the floor. And then the dimensions and the orientation of the map that you have, so you know how to, how to render it. Then there are a couple of APIs that were called. One is to get all the clients on this floor, and then the other one is to get a particular client given an identifier. So these are simple REST APIs, which are URL-based, so it's just a get request for a URL, and it returns a JSON request a response that you can pretty much pass and then render. The remaining three are pretty much rendering. They're just how to deal with layers and heat maps and uh, manipulate uh, data on a web browser. So fairly simple. And what I encourage you to do is we have some of these stations back there in the DevNet zone where you can actually go in 
call these APIs, play with it, uh, meet some of the engineers and ask them questions and so forth. Any questions for me? Yeah? So let me just repeat the question for everyone's benefit. So the question is, does this require the user to be connected to the internet using the Wi-Fi of the infrastructure, right? So it's a, it's a very good question. Just for analytics, you don't need the user to be connected because that's the probe that's sent out. And even if he's not associated, you're still receiving the probe, then you can do the analytics. So for this, because remember, this is just using the analytics stream, and then you're you know, accessing it through the MSC. You don't require that user to be connected. For the examples I gave, the actual user needn't have been connected because all I needed was the probe that came from him. But if you wanted the SDK and you wanted to push notification and so forth, then you do need the user to be connected. So the retail examples I gave earlier, you do need. But not just to find out location, you don't need the user to be connected. Question? Yeah. So let me repeat the question. The question was a follow up to, uh, to the earlier one, which is if the user is not connected, how do you identify them? Remember, for identification, you need a mapping from the MAC address or the UUID to an actual username. And that's what we were using the directory query for. So in my example, you already know the devices that people have. And so you do make that mapping. If it's a retail environment where somebody just walks in, you have to have some out of band way of tying this device to this person, otherwise you cannot uniquely identify the person. And that's probably a good thing for privacy reasons as well. You don't want to know somebody is there unless they've given you that information. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah? So this is a good question. So the question really is around privacy, and there's a lot of concern recently around privacy, and is there any regulation that's coming that's preventing you know, people from, uh, from doing analytics like this? So let me give you a little longer answer. So if you recall, a few um, I'd say years ago, a few iOS releases ago, pretty much the MAC address could be obtained by any application. And there were concerns that you know, the uh, app vendors could share this information among them and build a database at, you know, identifying this device ID with all of the um, activities that this person is doing. So Apple released something called UUID where they no longer give the apps the MAC address. So that's why we have to you know, use some clever techniques in the infrastructure to bind your unique device with um, or your unique device ID with your location. And so there has been some movement to prevent this exchange of information by different app vendors on you know, your preferences and priorities. So that has already happened. Now in terms of actually just using the, um, the ID for doing analytics, it's really anonymous because we just know how many people have come and left. We don't know that it is you. The only way we would know it is you is if you opt in and say, this is my MAC address, or if it's an enterprise, for example, where and by virtue of being employed with Cisco, Cisco knows all of our MAC addresses. So the idea is that if you're going to use, if you're going to give your MAC address, you have a clear opt-in where you do allow the, uh, you know, the company for locating you and doing services like this. So so far there is, you know, I think this is this healthy um, medium or healthy balance where you pretty much opt-in if you want to avail of location services on your device. Question? So let me repeat the question. So the question is really for step two and step three, where are these images coming from? And so if you look, Prime, which is our management console, has the flow plan because when you, you know, stick your AP in the ceiling, you have to tell Prime where the AP is located. 
So it's the same images that are really served out to your location, um, you know, application. And the good thing with this is that you don't have to go in and draw a map because that's part of the complexity of any solution. Okay, so I focused mainly on the detect part in this talk, but there's also the connect and engage. Not going to spend much time on it here. You can uh, you know, go in the DevNet zone and learn about this yourself. But just to give you a flavor, um, the connect part is important because a lot of people want Wi-Fi access when they enter a building or when they enter premises like this, right? And so having a simple way to connect is, is very important. And when you have them connect, you could use this to put them on a specific landing page, to put a promotional video, let them know about services or offers or coupons. Or you could even use something like Facebook to connect, and that way you can link the Facebook analytics with everything with the location analytics that you have already. So there are many use cases that um, you know that, that go into the connect and engage part. And I'll only talk about one of them. For example, when you uh, you know go into a mall, you can wake up the application. You can provide some information that there is a sale. There's only a couple of days left for this sale. You have a coupon, and so. There's a lot of things that uh, in retail can be done once you have this infrastructure in place. Now you may be thinking, well, this sounds good, but it's very complicated for me. I have to learn all of these uh, you know, REST APIs or JSON and program this. And the good news is you don't have to do this. There's a rich ecosystem of partners. This is just North America. And you can see that they are all over. So if you just focus on a few, the guest access, there's companies like Single Digit and Purple Wi-Fi that help with the guest access. We look at browser-based services. So there's companies like Front Porch that will inject ads in your browser that will tell you about services that are located nearby. And there's a whole ton of location-based apps. I didn't talk about this, but one very common application is museums. So when you're walking in, uh, there's a museum uh, in Atlanta that uh, we've been involved in called Fern Bank where pretty much all the exhibits that are exhibits of dinosaurs, when you stand in front of them, you can pull up on your iPhone or an iPad all the information about the exhibit. And that's basically using location technology and the back end that I described to pinpoint where you are and then downloading the content. And all of these partners are, are in the business of providing the whole building, the whole application, building the map for you and making it a, a great experience. There's also a bunch of analytics. So for retail, as I mentioned, analytics is a big thing. So Retail Next, uh, IL411, uh, Luxsoft, etc. A bunch of partners are building applications there. And of course, we have Facebook. We have marketing tools from Front Porch and SAP. And there's ads and offers as well. So there's plenty of resources. There are plenty of partners who are in this space. So you don't have to roll your own. You can hire one of them to build this for you. So with that, um, really, the call to action here is if you're interested in this, I encourage you to uh, visit the world of solutions. This has the actual complete CMX solution where you can uh, play with it. Or get a hands-on experience right down here with the MSC APIs. There are uh, little labs and classrooms where you can go in and type some of these and see the, see the response. I have a bunch of my engineers also floating down around the hall, so feel free to reach out to me. Uh, and I'll connect you with them. You can have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. And uh, you know, we have many, many demos that we can do for you. Our office is you know, just a few miles away in San Jose. So connect with me, and I'll set up a demo. So that's pretty much all I had in terms of prepared material. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, to take them or connect you with, uh, with some of my team. Yeah. I was asking about when is it, when is using MSCE alone is enough, and where do you need CMX? Because the REST APIs are always referring to MSCE. Uh, yeah. REST APIs. Yeah. This is, where is the CMX? Yeah, this, this is a very good question, and I think uh, partly we are to blame for confusing you, right? So MSC was the original name of the appliance, and CMX is the umbrella of the entire solution. So effectively, when I when we say CMX, we just mean the entire solution. The actual appliance that you're using is the MSC. 
So if you're using the MSC, you're part of the CMX solution. So there's no difference between the MSC and CMX. And, and I agree with you, we could have made it simpler and easier. I, I see some folks from product management back here. So we try and clarify this, but it's one and the same thing. I don't believe there is a difference between CMS, uh, CMX and MSC license. I think we just changed the licensing on the MSC uh, because earlier our licenses were based on clients, on the number of endpoints. <coughs> and again, there's a history for this. Because MSC was originally done for applications like in a hospital to keep track of devices. And so customers you know, knew exactly how many endpoints they had, and so the licensing was based on the endpoints. But if you listen to my talk today, you saw it's based on you know people walking in doing analytics. I have no idea how many people will walk into this floor. So that kind of licensing didn't make sense. So we changed the licensing scheme around just for that. And, uh, So again, for those of you who couldn't hear, so Rajiv is the product manager for uh, the CMX, and he clarified that we also have a CMX, uh, you know, comprehensive license. But everything I talked about here was available in the base MSC, and you can use it with just the base MSC license. Let me repeat the question. The question is on, you know, do we need a higher density of access points just to compute the accurate location? And the good news here is we, we are recommending a high density of access points simply because everybody now is connected over wireless. And so when you're deploying wireless in uh, enterprise in an office, you really want to have your access points, you know, between 20 and 40 meters away from each other. And that is more than sufficient for the accuracy that we require. So you don't really need to put a high density of access points to get a better location. If you're doing a high density deployment, which is what we recommend for most enterprises today, you get the location. The challenge really comes sometimes in large rooms like this. And that's where you need to be very careful in terms of how you place your access points. Um, and uh, again, for that, you need to do uh, a site survey and figure out the optimum location for your access. Any other questions? We good? Thank you guys. Thank you again for uh, for attending this talk. And I encourage you to walk around and enjoy this whole life.